Rachel Harkness. I'm the Programming Manager at the Portland Public Library, and we're so happy to be hosting Brock Clark today in conversation about his new book of essays, I Grape, or The Case for Fiction. With fellow writer and his former student, Sarah Demet, I'd like to thank our sponsors, Print, a bookstore, who are selling copies of the book, which we'll provide a link to in our chat stream. Um, so, just to introduce the authors, Brock Clark is the author of nine books, most recently the novel Who Are You, Calvin Bledstow, published in September 2019, which he was at the library to discuss not long ago, and the essay collection I Grape or The Case for Fiction, published March 2021. He's also the author of the novels The Happiest People in the World, which is a New York Times book review, editor's choice pick, an indie next pick, and an Amazon book of the month choice. Exley, which was a Kirkus Book of the Year, a finalist for the Main Book Award and a long list finalist for the IMPAC Dublin Literary Award, and an Arsonist Guides, uh, sorry, an Arsonist Guide to Writers' Homes in New England, which was a national bookseller and American Library Associate no Notable Book of the Year, a number one book sense pick, a Borders Original Voices in Fiction Selection, and a New York Times Book Review Editor's Choice pick. His books have been reprinted in a dozen international editions and have been awarded the Mary McCarthy Prize for Fiction, the Prairie Schooner Book Series Prize, a National Endowment for Arts Fellowship, and an Ohio Council for the Arts Fellowship, among others. Clark's individual stories and essays have appeared in the New York Times Magazine, Boston Globe, Plowshares, Virginia Quarterly Review, One Story, The Believer, Georgia Review, New England Review, and Southern Review, and have appeared in the annual Pushcart Prize and New Stories from the South anthologies and on NPR's Selected Shorts. He lives in Portland and is the A. Leroy Greeson Professor of English and Creative Writing at Bowdoin College. And Sarah Demet is the author of The Guinevere's, originally released from Flatiron Books, Macmillan in October 2016. It received starred reviews from Booklist and Library Journal, along with praise from O Magazine, People, L, Real Simple, Harper's, Bazaar, and New York Times Book Review. Southern Living voted it one of the best books of 2016 by Southern authors, and Bustle included it on their list of 2016's best debut novels. She is also the author of 90 Days to Your Novel, and her, and her short fiction and nonfiction have been published and anthologized in numerous places. Sarah holds a PhD in literature and creative writing from the University of Cincinnati, and she currently teaches in the creative writing program at Ball State University. So over to you guys. I just wanted to say thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so excited to be in conversation with you today, Brock. Um, so everybody out there knows uh, I was your former student many years ago back in Cincinnati, um, a place that you write about in I Grape that we'll hopefully we'll get to in a minute. But yeah. I thought we would, um, a question I would love to start with. Uh, I was your, so I was your former student. And what struck me as I was reading um, I Grape, the various essays, is that a lot of the novels and essays that you mention in there, because you love them, um, also became novels and essays that I love and eventually taught to my students. Um, John Cheever, Muriel Sparks, uh, George Saunders, Heidi Julevitz. So I guess my first question is this, um, you're a teacher. So to what extent do you teach and write about work you love versus um, what you think people should be reading. And I'm putting should be reading there in quotes because I think that you might be um, suspect of such a phrase. Yeah, first of all, thanks Sarah for doing this. And this is just an excuse for us to see each other again. So that's, I'm glad we got to do that, but thank you. Uh, yeah, you know, that's a good, really good question. Um, and I hadn't quite realized that I've been that uh, that pedantic. Like, yeah, you're going to read the stuff I love, damn it, <laughs> and, and, and love it too, as my, which is always my hope. Um, the notion of you, there are things that one should read, and that those things that one should read are somehow might be different than the stuff that you want to read, has always been kind of alien to me. Um, but those aren't two different things for me. I mean, I have the sense that you should uh, you should read the stuff you love, and then you should teach the stuff you love with uh, an eye open for learning other things that you all also might love. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, and so, and I guess um, that way you end up being kind of a proselytizer, like you're preaching things that you believe in. What's interesting to me about some of that is that I often will preach myself out of loving 
certain books. Like I'll read them so often or I'll teach them so often or I'll talk about them so often that I don't ever want to do any of those things with them again. Uh, and I think that's also part of a sort of natural part of teaching and reading uh, as a writer. I mean, I'm not sure what it's like for you, Sarah, but often I read so critically. I don't mean critically like I'm looking for problems. I'm reading for what I can get out of the novels for, for my own work. That becomes so tiring that I often exhaust certain books. This happened with Cheever, for instance, who's one of my favorites, uh, but I sort of fall in and out of love with him. And it has nothing to do with him or his work. It just has to do with the amount of time I spend reading him. Um, I never teach stuff. Maybe this goes back to your original question. I never teach stuff I don't love, right? I, I may teach stuff that I have reservations about, and that's probably true of almost everything. And I definitely teach a lot of things that I expect people won't love, right? Because they're kind of things that, are, that take risks. Um, and that's fine with me. But I never teach something that I don't like, but I think is important, right? The stuff I think is important, I also love. <laughs> those kind of aren't, those kind of, there's, there's no difference between them. What about you? Do you, like, how do you fall on this? Oh, gosh, the question's turned back to me. Uh -huh, uh -huh. I'm careful what I ask, huh? It's, um, evil. it's evil, isn't it? No, I, I think it's a risk to teach what I love sometimes for that very reason. I mean, students can react poorly to it or might you might through the course of teaching discover there's something you don't love about it that perhaps a student points out and then you can't unsee that. Uh -huh. So I do feel I can I do feel tentative sometimes when I teach something I really, really love so much that it might hurt me to expose it to the um, incisive eye of my students. But generally, I teach what I love. Um, I think that uh, I, what I love tends to be what you're mentioning, things that surprise me, things that are interesting. But I also am drawn to, you know, I teach creative writing myself. So students really want to write a lot of genre fiction. That's what they love. They love mm -hmm. fantasy. They love science fiction. Um, and I was, I was really compelled by your argument early on in the collection that reading literary fiction is good for you, akin to drinking vinegar to get rid of mucus when you have a cough. Yeah. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about kind of how you distinguish between literary fiction and genre fiction and why you think maybe reading literary fiction is better for you than say reading genre fiction or are, are these categories even useful? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, the, the way you were talking about earlier, like being, this is related kind of books you're scared of teaching, um, the books that you love, but you don't want to teach. I've several times tried to teach uh, The Movie Goer by Walker Percy, and it's just fallen flat every time. So some things just don't work uh, and you just have to get over it, right? And there's also those famous stories of Dennis Johnson, the great writer Dennis Johnson, crying in class at almost any, for almost any reason, but especially when his students admitted to not loving the things he was teaching them, um, which I totally empathized. And I've tried really hard not to cry when people haven't loved the moviegoer. Um, about this thing like literary fiction being good for you, that's sort of part of your question. It makes me hate literary fiction to even hear it being discussed that way. Uh, like this is sort of what you're talking about your first question, the idea that there should be a book list out there that's somehow uh, having to do with a kind of virtue, civic virtue, aesthetic virtue, uh, diet virtue. None of that stuff is why I read fiction. Like I don't turn to fiction because I think it's going to make me a better person. It might, and if that's the case, then that's just great. Um, but I don't go into it with that expectation or even that want. Uh, I go in it to be entertained. I go to be provoked, annoyed, surprised. Um, improved is not necessarily one of the things I turn to. Um, the genre of fiction thing is really interesting. I used to be a total knee jerk, have a knee jerk reaction to even the idea of genre fiction as being worth discussion. I'm talking like 25 years ago before even we met. And um, because I, you know, I didn't read it or I didn't think I read it. I read literary fiction and I believed in it. Like I believed in it for all the reasons I just talked about. But then I realized I began like really going through rather than just telling students, you know, you shouldn't read that crap. You should read the stuff I'm telling you to read. And that just got, one, it became hostile, the environment. And two, I realized it wasn't really true. Like I read books that could be seen as part of one genre or the other. Like I read like um, True Grit, for instance, is a Western and I've read it for decades and I love it. I don't think of it as a Western the way I think of like Lula Moore being Westerns, but that's just because it's a better version of the Western. It's not because it's not a Western. So I started trying to think of uh, genre work that would encourage my students who wanted to work in the genre 
to just write better versions of the genre work they already loved, right? So I've talked about George Saunders this way with writing like cave people stories, um, his great novella, Pastoralia, about two people working at a prehistoric theme park. That is, the theme park is set now, but it's about, you know, it's starring two people playing cave people. Um, or I'm trying to think of other genre stuff. Oh, well, anything by Raymond Chandler, any detective work by Raymond Chandler, um, any horror by Kelly Link, for instance. There's all sorts of great fiction that I guess is genre, genre fiction, but it's also doing the things that I think literary fiction does. And I think for me, after a while, I began not to be so concerned about whether it was genre or not. I am more concerned whether it was doing what it set out to do and whether it should set out to do something else. I, you know, there, there's some genre that I just don't love. I'm not a big fantasy person. Uh, okay. I'm not sure about you, whether you, how you feel about it. You're right. Well, like, well, it seems like, it seems like now there are so many hybrid works that are, you know, playing with the conventions of literary fiction and science fiction. So I read this great, I taught a great novel this past semester. It was called Light from Other Stars by a writer named Erica Swyler. Mm -hmm. And it's science fiction, but it's also literary fiction. And well, it, it made me think to what extent is genre just a marketing tool to sell books yeah. <laughs> anymore? Um, but I'm with you. I used to not want students to write genre fiction because I wanted them to write some better. Then I backed off of that and allowed them to write it and then got only, you know, cavemen stories and fantasy stories and vampire stories. And then kind of pushing back. I feel like I'm the pendulum is swinging in the other direction uh, as I, you know, want them want them to understand uh, the the possibilities of their work that aren't strictly limited to the things that they have been reading. And what's interesting to me about teaching in particular is that, uh, or in general, is that students will often introduce me to stuff that I've not heard of, that I, like, and that they're really into. And I think, oh, thank you. So I don't have to be such a jackass in the subject anymore. I can actually talk about genre work that I actually like rather than just saying, well, there's no genre work I actually like. Um, and also then I can also say, well, really, these are the things I don't like about this. It's always a good conversation to talk about the things one doesn't like in any work of fiction, any tendency, any orthodoxy, because then students are like, oh yeah, this is the thing they always friggin' do in this kind of story. Why would I wanna keep doing it? Um, it's not a way to keep the genre alive, keep fiction alive just by doing the same thing. Yeah, over, over again. Well, I think that that's one of the issues I see with a lot of the student submissions um, that are genre is that they're doing what has already been done and they don't mm -hmm. contain this element of surprise that you talk about throughout I Grape. And I love your meditations on surprise in fiction. Um, and you're right, what makes a novel great or for that matter, a novel is that it puts unlike things together. So the reader will then wonder why would the writer want to do that? I wonder um, to what extent do you, um, do you even think about these things as you're writing yourself? I mean, you talk a lot about what fiction can do and the element of surprise in fiction. Um, are you thinking about these things as you're drafting? I'm not thinking of them as whether I'm gonna make that choice or not, if that makes sense. Like I don't, so for instance, one of the novels that that um, I talked briefly about in the collection, I think, uh, and that Rachel mentioned, The Happiest People in the World, which is a, it's a novel that came out of my, me being in Denmark and falling in love with the country. Um, but then around that same time is when uh, Elon's Post in a, a Danish newspaper asked cartoonists to draw cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad as they saw him, which then blew up as a, in this, this series of acts of violence. The cart one of the cartoonists was threatened, not threatened, attacked, and then he had to go uh, underground. And the whole thing I found upsetting on both sides. And so I was like, you know, I'm going to take this figure and then I'm going to, who's supposedly one of the happiest people in the world. And I'm going to send him to where I'm from, upstate New York, which is the home to the least happy people in the world. Uh, and I'm going to turn him into a guidance counselor. And for me, it wasn't like, I'm going to make the choice because it's unlikely. For me, I was like, the choice made sense for me, for the kind of novels I want to write. And also because I just want to see then what will happen. But I'm not, I don't have like a sense of, well, this is too ridiculous or it's not ridiculous enough. Maybe I should, maybe things will work out a lot better that way, but that's just not, that kind of calculation, it just seems to me to be death, it just to guarantee a kind of death on the page. Um, and sometimes I'll think, well, this is too ridiculous. That is, I'm not interested in the ridiculousness and I'll ditch it. And sometimes I'll think, 
well, I've seen this a hundred times before and I wasn't interested in it then. Why would I try to do a version of it? So I don't ever worry about whether it's going to surprise or not. For me, it's often a kind of self-interest. Am I bored by this while I'm writing it? Uh, or am I interested to see where it's going to head? I mean, I, I do like this to try to find connections between things that don't at first blush seem like they're connected. Um, so for instance, to give you an example, I'm sorry, I'm going to just keep ranting about this, but um, in, this, in that novel, I went to... Boonville, New York, which is in the very bottom of the Adirondacks, not far from where I grew up. And um, uh, I knew for some reason I wanted the novel to be set there. I don't even remember why that was. I, I was attracted to the town as I drove through. And, you know, I had this cartoonist in mind and I had like, well, the cartoonist is going to be on the run. So in my mind, I'll, I'll bring him to Boonville. And then so I went there to do research and it I got there, I was like, I don't know what the hell I'm doing here. Like, I don't even know what I'm looking for. I'm just gonna turn around and go back to my parents' house and hang out with them, have cocktails. And uh, before I did, I said to go to this diner right off the town square. And um, I was by myself in the diner. I mean, no one was there except for me and the, and the cook and the waitress. Uh, see the cook over there behind the counter, which is just here, just, just, just screwing around, not paying attention to me. And I look over on the walls and there are like four or five clocks and one of them says like Istanbul, and one of them says Beijing, one of them says Moscow, one of them says uh, London. And one of the, and that was weird. Like there was no other kind of international theme to this restaurant. It's just an upstate New York diner. And one of the clocks wasn't broken, was broken, wasn't keeping time. And I was like, this is bizarre. So I wrote it down and I didn't think any more of it. And then I went back. And when I got back home, I started looking at my notes and I was like, you know, this would be an interesting place for spies to be training. And those clocks are somehow spy training exercises or triggers. And all of a sudden things began to make sense the way they wouldn't otherwise. And it made me really happy because I figured out a way to connect two things that didn't seem to have a connection. That is a long, ridiculous answer for a great yeah, okay. question. That's a, that's a central question that every writer asks oneself as they're writing is what the hell am I doing here? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's a kind of it's a kind of genre problem, right? I have the genre being a fiction writer. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of, speaking of genre, um, I, I think we need to have a conversation about your relationship with memoir um, and and maybe creative nonfiction. Mm -hmm. um, so <laughs> that's uh, a very scary way to introduce the topic, Sarah. I think we need to have a conversation. <laughs> so. You know, I teach, I, I frequently taught, taught uh, the novel is dead, long live the novel in, in my classes. I think that it is, um, it's a great uh, entry point into thinking about what fiction can do and how it can do it differently than what nonfiction can do. When I taught it this past semester, a student asked a really uh, sharp and compelling question, which is, why is he so cranky about memoirs? Um, so it got me to thinking, um, does your crankiness about memoirs stem from book culture itself, or does it stem from the writers of nonfiction? I mean, yeah. I think one of your arguments that I love is that um, is that uh, m writers of memoir take their experience as art versus making their experience artful and meaningful to the reader. So I wonder if you could talk a bit about that. Yeah, and like I'd say, and I, I, the height of me ranting about this was this novel I wrote called, called An Arsonist Guide to Writers' Homes in New England. Uh, and I've been kind of doing penance for it ever since. I mean, it, it, this is book is part memoir, right? There are books about writing, but there's a lot of me, a lot of my own stories, a lot of memoir within this essays about writing. Um, uh, I guess my problem at the time, this is now, shit, 2005. So however long ago when I was really thinking hard about this stuff a lot, was that exactly that, like too many times, too often memoirists were mistaking their story for a story. That is, they saw like, oh, it just be, it happened in my life and it was significant then. And so it must be significant to others. Um, my feeling about that has changed some since then, uh, maybe as I've read more and met more memoirists. Um, now the, the, the genre I really hate is auto fiction, which is where you have uh, someone like Ben Lerner uh, having a character named or resembling Ben Lerner, being identical to Ben Lerner, sort of making his way through a world that's very much Ben Lerner's world. And I'm just super bored by that kind of genre. Um, even, but though you even though you love Frederick Exley. Well, that's yeah, and none of this is consistent, Sarah. <laughs> I, think, I think there's all sorts of uh, contradiction in this 
in my work as a fiction writer and also in this collection. Yeah. So like, like, like I hate this work except for this one instance, which I love, even though it's exactly the thing I say I dislike. Um, I guess I, I teach with someone really great, Alex Marzano Lesnovich. And Alex's first book is this book about, it's a memoir, but it's also related to Alex's work on behalf of this convicted uh, child murderer. And so it had these two, again, these two things sort of put together in a book and they have connections. The connections aren't always even solid to the writer. And that's what the writer's trying to figure out is the connection between these things. That's an awesome book. It's an expansive book. Um, it's a, and it also has a plot. Like there's an investigation. Those books I love, they read like novels. I mean, that is praise. Um, other ones where they just were like, yeah, this, this is the thing that happened. There's not a lot of drama in it. Not a lot of nuance in the narrator or in the narrative voice, but it happened to those ones I get kind of impatient about. Do you, think that, do you think that this has anything to do with social media, with this idea that everybody has an audience and people feel compelled to, I don't know, bring their experiences to bear in a public way in these yeah, I mean, Yes, I think absolutely. I'm not on it very much, maybe for that reason. Uh, and maybe you, you, you could talk about this. I wonder about the, the Guinevere's whether you, there was a big push from your publishing house for you to do a lot of social media outreach for it. Um, that, I mean, I, they certainly said I should join Twitter, which yeah. I did. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> um, so, but the, I mean, no, not, not, I have heard stories of uh, publishers who were, you know, hounding their authors to, you know, create these campaigns online and through social media, but, I certainly didn't have that experience. Have I guess. You, for, I mean, obviously not. It's not yeah. work if they have, if they've pushed you in that direction. It's not, it's not been successful. Yeah, I, I guess this is, and I, I was, I have been pushed to do that, and I was just so lousy at it. So I guess my problem is not that people do it, obliged to do it. Um, like the so, so when I write fiction, this is what I hope I'm saying, and I agree. My life doesn't necessarily have any, or have any bearing on what's in the book. Um, I know it's a naive way to go about it, but that's, that's also how I read. Like I don't read for to find nuggets of true lives in the fiction. I read for the things I talked about earlier. Um, so the idea that the self it always has to be uh, has to be part of the process, I find stultifying. Now, if writers want it to be part of the process, cool. But the idea that it has to be in order for it to have some sort of meaning or importance, yeah. uh, that I, I I resent that. Um, <laughs> Certainly it's backfired. I know writers uh, who become very annoying online uh, yeah. and I actually like them better in person than I do online. What are their <laughs> names, Sarah? Or what? What are their names? <laughs> you can just, just tell me what their names rhyme with. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that's what the, the interesting part of this uh, pandemic where th so many things have gone virtual is that people I, I know in real life or writers I know in real life um, like in the absence of having that actual connection with them, some of them have become kind of annoying online and in, yeah. on social media. And I think people do, I don't think they realize that to, they, they do kind of a damage to their identity as writers, their credibility yes. as writers. Yeah, because yeah, when people, when people advertise for themselves, they become unlike, at least most people do, at least that's my fear. Um, and uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, but then again, it's the only, none of us are going to be in the Dick Cavett show, him being dead, and the show not existing, so I think this is sometimes this is what writers have to resort to, right? They have to, like, oh, this is my way of having conversations with people. I guess my feeling is that the conversations I want to have with people are in the books. There's this great thing, and I talk about this in the, in the book. I had this, I wrote this piece of satire for the Times about this, um, uh, what I saw as the mutual underpopulation problems between both Denmark and upstate New York. So I wrote, it was clearly a satire and clear, clearly to me at least, um, it both made fond, fond fun of two places I love and myself. And I just got a raft load of shit about it. Um, people were really upset about it. And partly they were upset because they assumed I was a downstater. I was from, cause it was published in the times. They assumed I was from Manhattan and, uh, that this is typical upstate downstate thing, which is obviously not true. But then like I had these invitations like to be on TV in Syracuse or to get in some sort of like panel discussion uh, in central New York. And I said, no, every time. And finally this one person was like, 
but I thought you'd want this platform. And I was like, I already had a platform and that's the thing that pissed you off so much. I don't need another platform to make things worse. Uh, I like, I just like writing as, you know, that's the thing. That's the thing I would want people to pay attention to. Um, yeah, yeah. And you know, it's like also you meet writers sometimes, this is especially true with musicians and filmmakers, I think. And you really wish you just listen to the music or watch the movie because they end up being disappointing. Uh, and I sort of miss the day when I just knew them by their art. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, maybe it's just an opportunity for me to rant and rail against uh, the uh, how, how social media will be the death of Western civilization. But um, I don't know, I think it, a lot of it has to do with people wanting to have opinions about things and say important things. Yeah. Um, and you but. do say important things. I mean, I, what I think is interesting is that while on one hand you, um, you think, uh, or you can, I, I, I use the word gripe a lot, but I don't necessarily mean that, but you, you gripe that people tend to think novels are important because they're about something that's perceived as important uh, or about a historical moment that's important or a subject du jour. And yet at the same time, your novels really do address some important things. Um, in uh, The Ordinary White Boy, you talk about race in Exley, you address war. Uh, you talk a lot about the role of writing and art in some of your other novels. So um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what, like what advice you give to people who want to write about important things without seeming as though they're writing about important things. Yeah, again, more inconsistencies. Thanks for pointing this out, Sarah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I do, I talk a lot about certain writers in this book. I talk a lot about Joy Williams, I talk about Paul Beatty, I talk about Muriel Spark, um, talk some about Colson Whitehead. And these are writers who, I, if you boil them down, you don't boil them down, sorry. If you think about their novels a particular way, like, oh, Joe Williams writes about the environment a lot. Uh, Whitehead and Beatty write about race. Beatty in his great novel Slumberland writes about the fall of the Berlin Wall. Um, but they do so in ways that make it difficult for you to say that with any kind of real authority or confidence. Like they've got a lot of things on their mind and they also come at these sub subjects sort of sideways. So the way I talk about in the book, there's this great novel by Paul Beatty called Slumberland. Slumberland and um, the focus of it, the thing it's aiming for is the fall of the Berlin Wall, but it's narrated by uh, uh, a DJ who's a juke, calls himself a jukebox sommelier who gets hired by this uh, bar in Berlin called Slumberland to basically be the black curator of music for white people. And it's so funny and it's so odd that you forget that there's a fucking wall about to come down. A huge <laughs> moment in our in Western civilization, 20th century Western, you really forget that, which is what makes it so great because it puts this in context of other odd but important things. And those are the novels I love, uh, novels that do have something on their minds. Um, but their minds don't work the way other people's minds do. They don't see uh, novels working the way other people think novels should work. That is that novels should be absolutely focused on the historical event. The historical event is a big thing, but you don't treat it, you don't treat important things, you don't do justice to important things by treating them head on. I guess that's what their ideas are. And that's certainly what my idea is too. Yeah. Um, the, the downside of that though is uh, some people will, will miss it entirely. Or they'll be pissed off. Yeah, go ahead. And it's okay to miss it. I mean, you could certainly read Exley as not being about war per se. I mean, you could miss that whole part. You could think it's about a father and a son. Um, and and maybe that's okay to miss to miss the big thing for the smaller story because the smaller story is what makes it more interesting and, and nuanced anyway. I yeah. mean, to say that The Great Gatsby is... Uh, is a novel about the roaring 20s, as you point out uh, in the novel is dead, long live the novel. Um, we think we know the 20s because we know Gatsby, but really we just know Jay Gatsby. Uh, yeah. We know his character because it's so, the, the novel is so well done. Yeah, that's right. But if we didn't know the novel, if the novel weren't so great, we would not think of it as emblematic of anything. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's right, yeah. Um, yeah, and part of this is the way we label things, but that's okay. We have to label things. That's I don't have a real problem with that. Uh, there's just a whole there's a whole kind of novel that makes you wonder the, how you ended up in the novel. Those are the novels I like the best, where you can't really you may go to it for one thing, but then you're suddenly on this other track, and you wonder how did I get here? And those are the novels I especially love. There's this 
a great novel that I mentioned in the book called um, the, Int the Intuitionist by Colson Whitehead, which is a, it's about a bunch of things. It's about passing, it's about integration, it's about lots of things to do with race and education. Um, but it's, it, it goes about its business by telling a story of warring factions of eleva elevator inspectors, the empiricists who like inspect them the way you should, and then the intuitionists who sort of feel their way around elevator problems. And when you start reading it, you're like, holy shit, how did the writer come up with this? And then you're suddenly interested in that thought process, which then brings you sideways into the big problem of race. Um, but you get to it in such an invigorating way, the whole subject seems transformed to me. And, and those novels I love, and those are the novels I want to write. Yeah, I like what you said. It's about a bunch of things. Um, and maybe that's what novels should be about. If we can ever reduce it to one topic, then maybe, maybe we should be wary of that. Yeah, maybe we should. And I, I can't think of a novel I love where you could really do that and do the novel any justice. Yeah, yeah. Um, I really want to talk about um, about your your essay. Um, what can fiction do? Not much unless it's set in Cincinnati, um, because place is so important to you as a writer, obviously. But you spent a, to a, a good fair amount of your time in Cincinnati. I'm from Cincinnati myself, uh, and you write, if I may quote. This is why all novels would be better if they were set in Cincinnati, which is the name for when you lose. When you lose, when you are in Cincinnati, you are in a place of no assumed importance, where there is no point in distinguishing between high and low, between genuine longing and cheap longing. You are in, in a place where value always must be salvaged or jerry-rigged or struggled for, in other words, earned. I love this argument. Um, you hey, know, you Sarah. Can, yeah. Sarah, keep, keep talking. I'm going to close my window because someone just fired up a lawnmower. So keep talking. Oh. <laughs> I love this idea that um, that Cincinnati is sort of a placeholder for a setting that um, kind of will bring us to this element of surprise that it's difficult to write about places we know and love um, so well because it's difficult to do justice to that. So I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit more about um, how difficult it is for you to write about the actual places you love and also will you ever write a novel actually set in Cincinnati? Yeah, uh, I, the latter, I don't think so. I would love to. Um, place meant so much to me. I do genuinely love it. Uh, so that line, you know, I write these things and I think they will make sense to the people who care about the places that I care about and the things that I care about. But then sometimes when people read them out of context, they're like, oh shit, people are in the center. I think, I think it's a city of losers. That's actually not what I meant entirely. Uh, it's not what you meant. I'm I'm protective of Cincinnati, yeah, right, and I indeed. felt such a I felt such a genuine longing when I read this um, this essay, uh, and it just I really felt like it 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 captured yeah even though you hate that phrase captured Cincinnati so well. I think partly uh, for me, I use Cincinnati as a metaphor. Like I once read that essay. I think it was at the University of Tampa, and I read it. And a poor person in the audience raised her hand and said, so are you really saying if my no if I'm running a novel not since in set in Cincinnati doesn't have a chance to be good? And I was like, it's a metaphor. So that you couldn't, that you don't recognize a metaphor means that maybe the novel you write isn't going to be any good. But no, it doesn't have to be set in Cincinnati. For me, Cincinnati is a sort of metaphor for places that people have not made up their minds about. Um, and so it becomes the kind of thing you can do whatever you want with. This is very much the way I've always thought about upstate New York as a, as a place I write about, which is distinct from the place it actually is. And those two aren't the same thing. I think of Cincinnati the same way. Um, it's also a place that's interesting because it's imperfect. And there's a great line by Donald Barthelme. I'm sure when you were my student, I wheeled this out 10 times a day, but that line, like, I'd rather have a ship wreck than a ship sails, things attach themselves to wrecks. That's the way I felt about Cincinnati. It had a, a place with tons of flaws that I rooted for desperately. That I really wanted it to work out, but it couldn't. But the minute it starts working out, then it becomes slightly less interesting, if that makes sense. Um, so it's a place you can both get behind, but a place that you can't really utterly transform. Uh, but there's still hope that you might. I'm being confusing here, but yeah, and I, I love the place in part because it's not the center of the universe. And I think the places that are the center of the universe are great to visit, but they can be dull as subjects of fiction. Uh, yeah. or as a kind of organizing principle. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Do you feel like you can only um, kind of understand a place after you've left it? I mean, you talk about this with Little Falls. Obviously, I, I think you maybe left wrote this um, essay about Cincinnati after you left Cincinnati. I mean, are these only things you can recognize in hindsight? 
yeah, I think that's that's awesome. And that's exactly the case for me, at least. I don't know about other writers. Um, that's true. I didn't write about Cincinnati at all until I left it. I think I'd set one story there. Uh, and I don't think I wrote anything in little, about Little Falls until or upstate New York until after I left it, for sure. So, yeah, I think that's partly it. And the distance is important. Um, but I've left other places and not written about them. You know, so I think I think I've never written about Carlisle, Pennsylvania. So I think that uh, it just depends. It just depends what the place is and how closely it matches your sensibility. Um, and my sensibility is about it's drawn to people in places that are flawed and the flaws make them interesting. It's not like I find them interesting despite their flaws. The flaws themselves are part of the thing that I find compelling. Um, it's very difficult. I'd love to hear other people about this. There, there's a big, you know, there's a big literary community in Maine. Uh, and there are a lot of great writers who write here and who also write about Maine. I don't think I'll ever really, I've written, I wrote 50 pages of a, the, my most recent novel was set in Maine. And then I got the hell out of there and went uh, to Europe. Uh, I think that Maine is one of those instances where people feel really strongly about it, uh, personally, socially, aesthetically. And I don't, like it's a place I live in and that I love but I don't feel compelled to write about it because so many people already are. Already feel more strongly than you do about it? Or have a stake in it. Like, I don't really want any part of the from away, not from away argument. Like, it's partly because it's been done a thousand times before, more than a thousand times. And what else could I possibly add? Um, but it's also a place like people, like, this is a place people want to go. You know, you bought a house here. Like, this is the way it is. I'm not interested in places that people want to go. I'm interested in places are, that people are leave. Are nobody wants to go to Cincinnati, Brock? No, probably not. Now it's transformed. Now it's becoming more like Portland. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, some of your actual characters now. Uh, actually, I'm thinking about Calvin Bledso because uh, you're just mentioning him being from Maine and then, you know, getting the hell out of there. And I love your argument that um what makes us good people makes us really bad writers um and in the case for meanness in fiction you say that fiction's you know not a place for a good-hearted process and if we try to make it so we we strip fiction of its ability to startle and surprise us yet another contradiction here brock um <laughs> calvin has been described on jacket copy and elsewhere as a lovable character and the book has been reviewed as optimistic so when you talk about the case for meanness in fiction, I wonder, are you not mean enough? Uh, I'm plenty mean. The, uh, I think the, <laughs> it's, it's, it's interesting to me just hearing some of the stuff. It's like being on one of those, this is your life moments. And you're like all the shit you've said gets like, like brought out and you have to face all the contradictions. Uh, except in this case, I don't think it's totally contradictory. contradictory. The thing you were just talking about meanness, I mean, a lot of those things are provocations and they're meant to provoke. Um, and they're not meant that Joy Williams, who one of my favorite writers of all time, she talks about her fiction being different from her nonfiction, uh, where her nonfiction's there to enrage and to argue. I wouldn't go quite so far with my nonfiction, but there are elements of that. And where I don't feel that way about my fiction, it's there to tell a story. And so whether it's good hearted or not, it has to fit the needs of the plot and the character. Um, but it's interesting when you talk about those two things in particular, I think I wrote the essay about meanness right before then I really started working in earnest on uh, Calvin Bledsoe. And that often, maybe this is true of all writers, maybe this is true of you too, but often my uh, subsequent work is in reaction to my previous work. So I think after I'd written that about meanness, I felt like I was, I'd said what I had to say. I meant it, I, meant, I still mean it, but I didn't wanna, not only didn't wanna write about it anymore, I wanted to write something that might be the opposite. That might prove it wrong. And I, I'm not, I ended up wanting to write about this character who is good hearted, uh, who's a decent person. Uh, he's got flaws, but meanness is not one of them. Um, and that's the way you keep yourself interested as a writer, as you start, you keep doing the opposite. We talked exactly. about this. I'm sure we talked about this when I was just, when you were my student, when we took in class together, where I used the example of an arsonist guy, where I hate subdivisions, the kind that are named like Stonehaven, like names that make no sense. But my dislike of them is not interesting maybe at all, but definitely not in a novel. So I thought, oh, I'll write from the point of view of people, a person who really wants to go to one of these subdivisions, who wants to hide there. That to me is a much more interesting novelistic route than just ranting. 
And yet you have some pieces in this and I grape that that are more nonfiction. I grape being one of them. Um, and certainly the love letter, the, uh, what's the, I love it? the love letter from upstate New York or it's, it's, I wish you had, I wish you had a long that. title. It's got a long title. It's called, I like how you put love in there. It's actually called the hate mail I got when I wrote about my hometown. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, the, uh, this, I began thinking about this book only as a book when I, I was a columnist for the Boston Globe for a little bit, I was writing this column called by the book, which are all columns about books but they were also memory columns. And um, I found personal ways to write about aesthetic things that I cared about. And when I started doing those, I had this great writer, editor there, Nicole Amy, and she allowed me to do more or less what I wanted to. And it turns out what I wanted to do was to write about books, but also to write about books by way of autobiography, um, very specific ones. So the I Grape, the title essay is about an argument I had with every single member of my family while trying to get my younger son to eat a grape uh, or no chicken to eat chicken. chicken. All he wanted to do was eat grape. And then it became an argue, argument about language. Um, so this makes it sound just like kind of gin up ideas that really aren't ideas about books. But for me, it's all about books. It's all about language. So there was that one. There's an essay that's part of um, the Cincinnati essay that I sort of folded into the bigger one about my grandmother going to visit um, uh, her husband, my grandfather's grave. Um, that to me is about books also. And I began to realize, man, books are everywhere in my life. There's not one thing that's been untouched by my writing, but also my, you know, lifelong reading. And I thought, why not kind of embrace that and then think about why that's so. So you can tell I'm getting kind of contemplative now, the tone even, the shift in this that, conversation, that, I know. That, shall I say the nonfiction has made you more vulnerable to your personal truths? <laughs> You're just, being, you're just being nasty now. Uh. <laughs> I had to go there. You know, I, what I love in iGrape um, is that you wonder if being a writer and a teacher of writing has made you kind of a miserable person uh, as relates to language and your mm -hmm. understanding of what it can do, what it should be doing. Um, and I can't believe that this is actually true, that somebody who um, dedicates a career to language actually becomes a more miserable person. But it does seem that iGrape is so much about miscommunication and also the ways that we do communicate. And this is exactly what the problem of the novel is. Um, it seems like every novel at its core is about the ways we miscommunicate and the ways that we connect um, right. and how to decipher the two. That's right. I think of the, the idea that if we go into the idea like the novel is the purest form of communication, then we have to ignore the thousands of novels that are narrated by unreliable narrators. Right. <laughs> I think that one of the things that novels make novels worth reading are the fact that they're not reliable bits of communication, that they're vexed, that they're contradictory. And this is what makes them compelling. Um, I, you know, it's not like it's not as though only as though Lang, spending so much time thinking about language and writing has made me miserable when it comes to language. But I am to alert alert to things to the, the degree that sometimes I wish I weren't, right? I wish that I could just sort of shut that off. Um, this is why sometimes watching movies is more of a comfort to me, not more of a comfort, um, more soothing than reading a novel because I don't really have strong opinions about how movies are put together. I don't have any kind of uh, vocabulary that's attached to the visual. So I'm not as nitpicky about it. And this is also attached, Sarah, to something you mentioned earlier, um, that I was, had, was going to make a great point that I just totally blanked on. Uh, books, making life miserable. I'll come back to it later on. Um, but yeah, no, I think, oh, the idea that somehow books make us better people, right? Yeah. I, I, I don't believe that, that that is necessarily so. I think it sometimes can be so. But I think it's useful sometimes to have, to be, as Saunders would say, counter-instructed. Like, you know, to be like, oh, if we believe that books inevitably make us better people, why don't we examine times that it hasn't um and then talk about whether we still like the novel anyway so i'm talking about unlikable characters like david gates is great un unreliable and unlikable characters i still love those books a lot not I, I love them because they're populated by these characters and you make something beautiful out of them so if, if books don't make us better people and in um and, and i'm with you that i don't think they necessarily do and if books should not uplift us um then why should readers come to read a novel in the first place? What should they be looking for? I think books can uplift us. Uh, I don't think they inevitably do. Um, and I'm not even sure what we mean by uplift. 
Like it usually for me, <laughs> if I knew, then I would try to do that maybe. Um, I think they can entertain us, right? I think they, I'm not sure about you, Sarah, but I've read so many novels over the last 14 months, none of them having to do with the apocalypse, none of them having to do with um, contagions. I've avoided those books entirely, but I've read a ton of books and that's because they've just, they're kind of glorious distractions. So that I, I, sometimes I don't know that we need books for any other reason than that. Right, yeah. we, and we can all go to dip books for different reasons. Um, that's one of the things that I do. I, I go to them because they inspire me to write books that are either like the books I'm reading or the exact opposite of the books I'm reading. Like I think, you know, we can go to books for a number of reasons and if they end up uplifting us, then great. Yeah, you know, I, I think going back to some of our conversations about being teachers of creative writing, I think we sometimes have to remind our students that entertainment is a part of yeah. writing fiction. Yeah. Uh, they want to write something important or they want to write, you know, world building is the phrase that I hear a lot these days yeah. that yeah. Um, kind of drives me a little batty. Uh, but, you know, um, it is, I mean, entertaining is probably the fundamental thing that people should be thinking about, not being boring. How do yeah. you remind yourself That's not right. to be boring in your own work? I'm not sure if you remember this, this is about entertainment, but in Cincinnati, uh, there was a poet there whose name I will also not mention, but he accused our good friend, the great writer, Michael Griffith. He's like, all you guys, meaning the fiction writers there, both students and faculty, all you care about is, what you care about is entertaining. And we were like, yeah, uh, totally guilty. Like I, that's, uh, you know, th that can mean a bunch of different things, but I do want to entertain. How do we teach our students, Sarah? I forgot the question now. How do we teach our students to... Entertain. What was my question? I don't know. What was my question? That was a good one. Roll back the tape. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think it was. I think it had something to do with teaching students how to be teaching students uh, how, to, how to not be boring. That's yeah, what it I mean, I think some of it is having to do with language, making sure language is a kind of thing that's constantly refreshing itself and not using cliches unless the cliches matter. The other is to look at the orthodoxies, orthodoxies and the genres they love. And try to yep. avoid them. Yeah, I think that's how you do it. Thank you for that great conversation. We did have some questions in the chat. If you guys are willing to answer, I'm just going to scroll up here. Um, the first question was, oh, Brock, did you, um, are there any authors or pieces of writing or essays that you wanted to include that you couldn't work in either because of length of the book or um, uh, uh, like you just couldn't, you couldn't fit them in somehow that you wanted to discuss? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, so my, 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 this, my reading scope is noted, noted for its limitations, not for its scale. Uh, so it's more like I had to get rid of repetition. I kept coming back to the same writers, which I try to make a virtue of in the introduction to the book. And I do think in some way it's a virtue, but sometimes I kept bringing up stuff that I'd already covered. The one writer I really wanted to write about and I could not make work for the both the essay but also for the book was uh, Kazuo Ishiguro, who's one of my favorite living novelists. I really wanted to write about this notion of um, the critic James, oh my God, Sarah, what's his name? Uh, he's married to James Wood, the uh, literary critic. He gave my favorite book by Ishiguro, The Unconsoled. He said in that a review of that, I think it was in the New Republic, that uh, Ishiguro had created, his, had invented its own category of badness. And my, my take on that, I, I really love that quote, even though I disagree entirely. My idea is that all writers have to, all writers worth anything have to risk badness in order to create something that's really unique. Uh, and I believe that about Ishiguro, but the scope of it, it just got way out of hand. And then it ended up being in my head, 40 pages long and on the page about, 30 pages and I wasn't remotely done with it yet. And so I had to put it aside, but he in particular, I really, and still want to write about, um, cause he's one of these really popular novelists that still really, he's dense in ways that I think a lot of readers miss. I mean, dense in a good way, not as in dumb. Um, yeah, I'm not sure Sarah, how you feel about him at all. If you care about him as a writer, but I've come to care a lot about him. I like the notion of denseness that you miss. I mean, I do, um, I do think challenge is a good thing. Like we should want to, we should come to want to, to fiction to be challenged. Uh, right. And I think that there has been a tendency to want to move away from that with, you know, like really spare fiction or um, I don't know, even sometimes this move towards, I'm probably getting to a lot of 
hot water here, but towards like fabulism and um, like magical realism as a way of avoiding talking about reality, but also as a way of uh, engaging with reality. I think that, um, I don't know, there's just something something interesting to be said there about just a nice, dense yeah. novel. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And then Rachel answered that question also. And there are a bunch of others I would love to write about. Um, just to find the time. I mean, whenever I write essays, it's something I'm not doing on one of my novels or stories. So I think, yeah, it's just, uh, there's a finite amount of time, but there are a lot of writers who I, oh, John, Tom Drury is a writer I love. I want to write about him, um, about Virginia Woolf. I like to write about, I had making notes, but yeah, I have lots of notes and fewer essays. It's a balance. Um, okay, we have a couple more, uh, let's see. Brock and Sarah, I appreciate the discussion's focus on place and its influence on story. Is there a book you enjoy written about Cincinnati or is there a Cincinnati writer you really enjoy to bring it back to Cincinnati? That was great. Sa Sarah, you're the native. <laughs> well, you throw that one to me. Yeah. Um, a, a novel set in Cincinnati. Why am I blanking on novels well, set in Cincinnati all of a sudden? Where's the, there's, our, there's Leah's, Leah Stewart's novel. Um, yes, yes, yes. Is that one Husbands and Wives? I forgot which one is set in Cincinnati or is it The Story of Us? Story of Us. No, I can't remember. There's a writer who, uh, who teaches at University of Cincinnati named Leah Stewart, who's written a novel set in Cincinnati. I, you know, for me, they're just, I don't know of a ton that are set there. Uh, and I can't think of one in my, particular. My, yeah, novel, no. my novel, the, um, my current novel that I'm working on is set in Cincinnati. Um, so look for it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to ask you about it. What's it called, Sarah? Uh, right now, it's called Earthshine. Um, who knows if that's uh, the name of it, the future, but, you know, reading your, your essay about Cincinnati, the place you go when you lose, um, I was thinking this, this is exactly it. This is like my <laughs> protagonists have lost and here they are in Cincinnati. Um, but I, I love the Midwest. I, I, um, I think that there's just so much richness that could be explored in, in the body of Midwestern literature. So I can't think of anything specifically set in Cincinnati right now, but I'm sure I'll, I'll think of it. Well, there's that novel by Richard Powers called Gain, which is a Procter and Gamble novel. I can't remember if he calls Cincinnati, Cincinnati. He doesn't call Procter and Gamble, Procter and Gamble. Yeah. But I, I think it's supposed to be set in Cincinnati. So, and that's a good book. Um, okay, and uh, here's one more for both of you. What are you currently reading? Uh, I'm actually reading this book right now uh, called Generation Loss. It's a, it's a main novel, it's a detective novel by Elizabeth Hand that someone had recommended to me. It's set in an island uh, down east, uh, but it's narrated by a sort of punk era photographer, uh, sort of a junkie uh, who ends up following this mystery. And it's really good so far. I'm about a third of the way through and then it's really compelling. And it makes me realize, yeah, I'm not gonna write about Maine because this person's doing it in this kind of interesting way. Why would I, why would I do that? I've been reading a ton though, but Sarah, what about you? What are you reading? Um, a book I read that I, I really loved recently was The Illness Lesson by Claire Beams. Um, it's kind of a loose retelling of Lucy May Alcott's father's um, like utopian experience mm -hmm. experiment. Um, and it's, um, it's about a group of girls at a girl's school uh, created by this um, man with good intentions, but the experiment goes awry in many different ways. And it's just beautifully written. Just at the level of language is a really beautifully rendered novel. It sounds great. I, I hadn't heard of it. Do you, so are you an avid reader of historical novels? Would you call this an historical novel? You know, um, I, um, it is set historically. Whether or not I believe it's a historical novel is probably a different subject. Um, I'm not an avid reader of historical novels. I'm just an avid reader of novels that I think sound interesting. And this one happened to be set in a historical. Yeah, I, that's such a mature way of thinking about this. I've got to grow up a lot. <laughs> uh, but I, that is, though, that's a, that's a healthy way of thinking about it. I'll, so what's it called again, Sarah? I'll write it down. The Illness Lesson. Oh, lesson. OK, cool. Um, and I actually have gotten to the point Rachel, where I have to actually write down in my little book, books I've been reading, because I will just forget immediately. Uh, and I, so that means that the book's over here somewhere, but I'm not going to get up and get it, which means I can't really <laughs> answer the question. I reread at the beginning of the pandemic, or read a bunch of Dickens that I've been reading to read, and, uh, and that was a lifesaver because they take a lot of time. 
and you need a, a certain level of concentration. I wasn't going anywhere. So I had the time and the wherewithal to read them. Nicholas Nickleby, our mutual friend, and one other that I'm playing at Bleak House. And uh, that was just a pleasure. It took me a long time to like Dickens, but now I really love him. That sounds like the perfect pandemic um, activity, Dickens. Um, and just for the record, Brock, if, if there's only one voice saying it, I would love to hear your take on Maine in a book. <laughs> there's a there's a lot of takes on Maine, but I don't I can't think of any satirical voices. Maybe there's one person who's eluding me, but um, well, Ron Cur Ron Curry does right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I think Ron's the one who's like, yeah, that's how you do it. If you can't do it that well, then you shouldn't be doing it. Um, but yeah, yeah, you don't have to. You, you don't have to write a about a place to really love a place. I guess that's my idea. Like it, that's not how you necessarily express your love, as I found out painfully over and over again. Maybe you don't write a place to protect the place to protect that's, your love of a place. That's true. That's true. Right. There's so many reasons not to live. Right. Not to write a novel. <laughs> <laughs> um. Well, that uh, that was great. I'm just going to scroll down here. Um, Nicola says, great work, you two, uh, Nicola and Michael. And there are some other thumbs up and, and things. But uh, thank you so much, you two, for uh, having such a great conversation. I laughed out loud, which I don't always do, but there were some really funny um, pieces of the conversation. So thanks for that and uh, for joining us today and putting so much into the conversation. It was great to have you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thanks, Sarah. Thank